I am thankful for the opportunity here in the middle of the week to talk with you. And I actually have a fairly uh, important list of things to work through with you. So I'd like to invite you to go ahead and just sit down and to give attention to this video. And I'll try to be clear and to be as quick as possible so I don't waste any of your time. One of the topics I want to talk about is the topic of reopening. And when is it right and when should a church reopen and what do we think about churches that are reopening? You see, over the weekend, a number of prominent ministries here in California decided to defy governor's mandates and directives and go ahead and to open. A number of those pastors, a number of those ministries went ahead and put some things into print. And you have read those things. You have seen on social media the churches that have reopened. You've heard their conclusions. You've heard why they are reopening. And you've emailed me those things and you've texted me. And with that, you've asked a couple of very important questions. For instance, you've asked me the question, what do I think about these pastors and preachers who are saying these things about reopening? And you're also asking the question, when is it right for Faith Baptist Church to open? And would we ever get to the point that we would defy governor's directives and mandates and go ahead and reopen? So I'd like to take a couple of minutes and try to answer those two main questions. The first one, and it'll save me a lot of time on email and responding to the many of you who have sent me those things. What do I think about these ministries and preachers that are sharing with us that we should defy governor's directives and go ahead and reopen? I have a couple of concerns, and I'm not picking on any one church or any one pastor. Uh, in fact, many of the men who have reopened, I have great respect for. So I'm not picking on any one person or any one ministry, but I do have a few what I would call pastoral concerns. One of my concerns in a lot of what I'm reading and what I'm hearing is a lack of emphasis on church autonomy. What I mean by that is that God has given to each individual church body the responsibility to make decisions before God regarding what they believe is best and right. We're not a church that's part of a denomination that answers to a denomination and takes leadership from a denomination. Churches, individual bodies of believers, have the responsibility to do what they believe is best and right in the will of God. Now what that means is that some churches may believe it's right to reopen, and it is right for them to reopen. But at the same time, it may be right for another church to stay online and not reopen right away. And in the things that we're hearing and in the things that we're reading, we need to be very, very careful to remember that there is a local church autonomy, and every church is responsible to make the best decision that they believe is right. Another thing I'm kind of concerned with is the tone I'm hearing. Uh, in some things that are written and some things that are being said, there is a sarcasm. Uh, there is a disdain and a disrespect of government authorities. At the same time, sometimes there's a tone of harshness, even lightheartedness. And I think if there was ever a time to be very, very careful, not just about the words we say, but the tone with which we say them, now is the time. And so I am a little concerned with some of the tone in these things. I think we have to weigh that tone and consider what we're hearing when we do. A third concern is just the publicity. I think if a church decides to reopen, reopen. If it's right to do, then just do it. We don't advertise that we are. We don't make a big point that we are. Just do it. A fourth concern is what I would call questionable motives. Now, I'm not questioning motives, but at times it's hard to determine whether a church is reopening because they really want to glorify God or they want to give it to the government. I think all of us know that the chief motive that we ought to have is the motive to glorify God in all things. And if it is right to reopen, then we need to make sure that the motive of glorifying God is the premier motive that comes through in how we reopen. Finally, and it's probably the concern I'm most concerned with, and that is some of the name calling that I'm hearing. There's a lot of phrases like pastors are spineless and uh, pastors are fearful 
and uh, pastors are without courage and the pastors who aren't reopening their churches like others are, are cowards. Now, I am a pastor and I'll go to bat for a pastor in a heartbeat. It's something I'm pretty passionate about. And I just want you to know that the pastors that I know who both have chosen to reopen and the pastors who've chosen not to, none of them are men I would call cowards. They're not men who are spineless. In fact, the pastors that I'm familiar with are some of the most sacrificial, God-fearing, biblical men I know. And I don't know of fearful cowards that are in the pulpit. I know they exist, but I think generally speaking in the churches that you and I are familiar with, the men that are leading those, pa those churches, those pastors that are doing their job, are men with great courage that are doing their very best to determine what God's will is and then follow it and do it. So take those concerns, all right? Don't, don't label one particular person or ministry and say, uh, Pastor Ron is against them. I, I'm not. But I would be neglectful if I didn't just share with you those concerns. Those people are on social media. The things they've written are all over the place and you're reading them, I'm reading them, we're seeing them weigh those concerns and process what you're reading with those concerns. But at the same time, let's carry together two hopes. I, I, I have some real hopes. Number one, I have the hope that these churches that are reopening, that they will put a pressure upon government officials that pressures government officials to say, we probably better go ahead and reopen. And I hope that's one of the outcomes. A second hope is that any church that has reopened I genuinely hope that the gospel is preached and that people get saved in those services. I am hopeful that that will happen. And I'm really excited that some are opening and I hope God really blesses with souls saved. Now that leads to the second question. And it's a question that's surfacing in almost every conversation I'm having with people. And it's this question. Would Faith Baptist Church of Folsom ever defy government orders and just go ahead and choose to reopen? And the simple answer to that question is yes. I think there is a day coming in which Faith Baptist Church of Folsom will need to choose to reopen despite public or popular opinion and maybe even despite what government orders or precautions are out there. I really believe that day is coming and, and, and at the same time, I, I don't think that's a decision that we make quickly. I don't think that's a decision we make reactively. I think it is something that we make thoughtfully, biblically. I think we need to be unified on that decision. And at the same time, we have to be willing to count the cost to take a stand like that. And all of that, just kind of leads me to say this. I commit to you that when that time comes and when it's right for us to take some stands, I am going to lead us to that conclusion. I'm not going to drive us to that conclusion. I'm not going to just give it to you. I'm going to lead us to it. I've often thought this way, one of the differences between a preacher and a pastor. A preacher is going to give you a conclusion and ask you to believe it and follow it. A pastor is going to preach, but more than just give a conclusion, a pastor is going to lead the sheep to that conclusion. And I commit to you that when it comes time for Faith Baptist Church of Folsom to really begin to take some stands, we will thoughtfully and biblically take those stands, and I'm going to lead us to that conclusion. Now what that means is we will take time for videos like this to kind of work through some things. Even the length of this video today is um, part of this plan to make sure that I am leading us to some conclusions, not just giving them to you. And so we're going to take time. We're going to study God's Word together. We're going to pray for these things. And we're going to make sure that when it is right to do, we do it the right way way. 
My greatest fear is that we would take a stand and do something that really is right, but if we do it for the wrong motives or the wrong way, we can do the right thing without God's blessing. And I don't want to walk into the kind of pressure that is on the horizon of a church like ours without God's blessing. I don't think you do either. So I, I ask a couple of things. Would you, number one, commit to pray about this? In addition to praying about it, would you pray for me to have wisdom, and to really have the mind of the Lord on these things? And so I, I would covet your prayers and ask you to commit to that. Two, would you commit to study these things out for yourself? I, I find it slightly humorous, and I, I'm not uh, trying to be lighthearted at all, but one of the verses that is quoted quite often is, we ought to obey God rather than men. But it's interesting to me that when men start to do something, everybody wants to follow them. And here is not the time for us to follow another man or another ministry simply because they have done something. It's the time for you and I to study it out and make sure that we're doing what we're doing because God has said so. So I invite you to really study the Word these days. Let's make sure we are thinking biblically in all of these matters. Also, would you strive hard to really obey God in all practical and personal matters. None of us want to take a stand and obey God publicly on some things like possibly reopening in the face of pressure and persecution without being right with God. In fact, I would go so far as to say if we're not living practically in obedience to God on the minor things of life, we're really going to struggle to obey God on the major issues of life and the major issues that may come to our church. Now is the time for each one of us to be as holy as we possibly can. I was thinking earlier this week after seeing a sign in front of a restaurant. The sign in front of the restaurant said some things not to do during COVID. And one of the ones that caught my attention and was most humorous to me was it said, do not weigh yourself. The 19 of COVID stands for pounds. And I had to smile about that. And the person I was with, we talked quite a bit about how there is an increase of ice cream consumption in homes and a lot of fresh baked cookies are being consumed. And it is somewhat true that there is some additional weight that has come to people during COVID-19. But our conversation quickly turned to not just the physical weight that some have gained during this time, but the question of, is there a worldly weight that we have gained during this time? And the truth of the matter is, for some, there is a greater worldly weight in their life. Now, think with me, okay? When we're talking about worldly weight, it, it may not mean that you cuss more than you did before COVID. It, it may not mean that you are watching more rated R movies now than you did before or that your music has changed. Let's remember here that worldliness may not always manifest itself in just a select particular set of behaviors. Sometimes worldliness is just seen in our values. And there are some things that have kind of leaked into our life and we have gained by way of worldly weight in which there are some worldly values that have come into our life that weren't there or weren't as prevalent before COVID. I think for all of us, we kind of need to step on the scale, spiritually speaking, and ask ourselves, is there a greater worldly weight in my life? Have the values of the world really begun to add themselves to my life? And I, I would hope for all of us that we would shed some worldly weight right now and to the best of our ability, be as healthy spiritually as we possibly can. Now that does go to this thought. We're going to have to really take seriously worship at home if we're ever going to take seriously a public worship that may mean we're taking a stand in order to publicly worship as a church. I would go so far as to say our strength in public worship is never going to exceed 
how healthy our worship is in the privacy of our own home. I'm going to ask you to consider something this Sunday. Would you refrain from multitasking in your home worship? Now, I am speaking to some. You're choosing to listen to a message while you are on a trip on Sundays, or you're doing yard work listening to the YouTube video. You are multitasking and doing some things and tacking into it, listening to the Word of God. I, for one, really do enjoy listening to a message when I'm walking or when I'm working in the yard. But when it comes to Sundays, it's the Lord's Day. And because we honor God, because we honor His Word, I really believe there's value in our ceasing from multitasking and saying, I am going to singularly worship God on Sunday. I know. I'm right there with you. Online home worship is not the funnest way to worship. It's neither the easiest way to worship. For some of you, it highlights your loneliness. For others, it seems that your children are the most disobedient when you sit down to worship as a family. For others, the moment you sit down with your spouse, it seems to bring about conflict. And I understand all of that. But could it be that there really is a spiritual battle raging? And there's a battlefield here in our worship. And we're going to have to really put our feet down and dig our heels in and prayerfully and carefully and with great effort and discipline really fight this battle and try to win in regards to private worship. And so let's be real careful about multitasking and take Sundays as seriously as we possibly can. Another question that has come up a couple of times this week, and I think it's a good one, and I'll just go ahead and kind of put it out onto the table in front of us, and that is, in regards to fellowship, at what point here in our church is, are we comfortable kind of inviting people over or hanging out with people in our church for the sake of fellowship? And I, I think I can say this. Why don't all of us just take the concern of being with people off the table? And, and let's just kind of treat each other with this amount of grace. I'm going to assume that folks at Faith Baptist Church want fellowship. And so I'm going to at least invite people into my home. I'm going to offer to meet them for a walk or uh, for a cup of coffee. And if they're not comfortable, you can very, very quickly and respectfully say, I'm not comfortable. But let's assume that people do want the fellowship and let's start going after it. Fellowship is something we cannot offer online. We cannot offer it virtually. It's really up to each one of us to really take seriously fellowship and to pursue fellowship with other believers. There's a strength in numbers, and right now for a lot of Christians, they feel like they are one of a very, very small number. The strength in numbers comes by being reminded that we are part of a greater spiritual family, a church body. And for some people in our church right now, they need to know that you care for them. And I would really encourage us to go after that. I've taken a lot of your time. Let me close out with this. Hey, it's okay to ask for help. I know that there are some in our church that are really struggling in regards to discouragement and to depression. And you may not be anywhere close to uh, what I would call a cliff where you are considering taking your life. But you're really not in a good place mentally or emotionally, maybe even socially and ultimately spiritually. May I encourage you, if you're not in a good place right now, to reach out to myself, to any one of our pastoral team, really to anyone in our church and say, I need some help. I don't believe any one person in our church would ever make fun of you or consider you a weak person asking for help. In fact, I would encourage you, ask for help now. You may not be at the cliff's edge. This is the time to ask for help. So go ahead and ask for it. Now, it may just be financial. Some of the financial repercussions are really starting to hit some of our folks. We don't have a mountain of benevolence, but we do have some benevolence, and we want to use that well. And so if you're in need of some financial help, Maybe it's just help around your house. 
go ahead and let me know and we'll do our very best to come along and help you. Let's just kind of all agree it's okay to ask for help. It's okay. Now I've taken a lot of your time. As we close, I want you to know something, and that's this. I love you with all of my heart. I'm sitting in an empty auditorium tonight filming this, wishing that the day would come sooner rather than later, that we are gathered back together face to face, worshiping our Lord in song and reading His Word. But tonight, and as I do so many other times, I am praying that God's will would just be done. I don't always know exactly what that will is, and you don't always know exactly what it is. And so we pray, Thy will be done. Maybe you're where I am. And that is, as we pray that, I say, Lord, I want your will to be done. Well, maybe I don't. And I find myself really struggling. I say I want His will, but in my heart, I'm not sure if I do. And so I have to quickly pray, and maybe you need to pray this way too. Lord, help my will to be your will. What I want to be what you want. And I believe that one of the things that God is doing in so many of our lives is He's bringing us to a place where we really want what God wants. And we're in the, when we're in that place, we can say, Oh Lord, Thy will be done. I look forward to seeing you virtually online this Sunday. I'll see you then. Lord bless you.